In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, Alleluia. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Alleluia. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Teach me your way, O Lord. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out my whole hands. Glory be to the Father. cry aloud, Alleluia. Your face, Lord, do I see. Hide not your face from me, Alleluia. 
Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for Exaudi, the seventh Sunday of Easter, is from Ezekiel chapter 36. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, 
and be careful to obey my just decrees. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 4. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another 
as good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God sits on his holy throne. I will not leave you as orphans. I am going in a way, and I will come to you and your hearts will rejoice. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th and 16th chapters. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our common Christian faith and show love for one another by confessing together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Where is Jesus? How does the Christian live in the intervenient time, the time between the ascension of our Lord and the last day, the day of judgment? We might follow after our doubts and think that he has forgotten us, forgotten the people of his promise. Perhaps having set the church in motion, Jesus ascended and then left us to fend here on earth for ourselves. That's what the disciples thought after our Lord's resurrection. They hid away in the upper room or they hid in their work Not quite sure if Jesus was the man they thought he was, the man of his word. They grew impatient. Their prayers faltered. Their mercy towards one another even ended. They drew into their shells for fear and with doubt. And perhaps that's where you are today as well. But hear this word from Jesus. I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus promised that he would not leave those disciples or you alone, but that he would come to you, that he would come and your heart would rejoice. But the disciples were in for a difficult patch, rough sailing, indeed death at the hands, who would think that they, by killing the disciples, were worshiping the true God. And notice in particular those who would cause these disciples the most grief. Jesus said, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Those who will make the disciples' life most miserable even kill them, will be fellow believers, people who think that they are serving God. According to Jesus, then, who challenges faithful Christians to abandon the faith the most? Who is it that heaps scorn and ridicule on those who believe Jesus? 
He had said repeatedly that the world, the devil, and all the demonic host will seek out your hurt and harm. But Jesus today wants you to also know that there will be challenges to the true faith from even within the church. And actually, even in the church, it's going to be even more hostile, more difficult than the world. Not only from outsiders, but also from insiders will be those who seek to shipwreck your faith. Family, friends, even those who call themselves Christians will seek out your hurt, and your harm. Today, Jesus says that his disciples will suffer and often will be martyred for the truth. And they'll be martyred by those who are the upstanding religious types. They'll be martyred for the truth. Now, you remember that Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Now, today's popular thinking, of course, is that there is no such thing as true, or rather, that whatever is true for you doesn't need to be true for me. Truth is whatever you believe in your heart. Most consider it actually ignorant to suppose that any one person or group has a corner on what is true and right and real. So it's one thing to dispute with a family member or a friend about trivial things, preferences, politics, but it's another thing to suggest that there is only one true faith, one true Lord and Savior, one baptism, one forgiveness of sins. That's probably why you're taught from a young age to avoid talking about religion and also politics and one other topic among family or friends. The prophecy of Jesus, though, and the experience as it's recorded in the Acts of the Apostles reveal that it's true. Even those who call themselves Christians will oppose you, you who believe truthfully, rightfully, faithfully, orthodox. That's because sometimes we like to just use the label Christian as an excuse to avoid confronting error, false teaching, or immoral behavior. We're all Christians, right? Shouldn't we just turn a blind eye to our differences? Can't we just agree to get along? We all have one Jesus after all. We don't have to agree on everything that he said. But Jesus himself disagrees. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but by me. And the apostles also agree. They say, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. And also, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he has received from us. Now, that's not a popular teaching at all, is it? To tell the erring brother, the false believing or false practicing brother or sister in Christ here in the congregation, to leave. But actually what we're saying is repent. Hmm. Of course, there's a long history in the church of times where error was actually confronted and refuted and the truth preserved. We actually recall this every time we gather. We confess one of the ancient ecumenical creeds. Today, the Apostles' Creed which was given in the Church of Rome to correct errors regards to the faith of the baptized. On Sundays where the sacrament is celebrated, we confess the Nicene Creed, the creed which rejected the Arian apostasy of the third and fourth century. And Christians, Christians actually died because 
of the truth. They died preserving the truth for your sake, that you would hear and believe what Jesus has said. And that's because those, even who called themselves Christians, but who refused to hear and to listen to Jesus himself, actually have not known the Father nor Jesus. The apostles themselves, the 11 that heard this word on that night, they were all, with one exception, tradition says, martyred for the truth. They died to confess Jesus. And in the two millennia that have followed since, Christians still die daily to defend the truth. They die to confess the apostolic faith. And what is this apostolic faith? How can you claim to know the truth? How can you possibly know with any degree of certainty that what you believe is the God's honest truth? Well, Jesus today tells you. He said, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. When Jesus promised you that you would not face this time of the church alone, he promised in that same breath the paraclete, that is, the helper, the comforter, the advocate. He helps, he comforts, he advocates for you by bringing you to Jesus. He is sent from the Father to bring you to Jesus by the word. And how then has Jesus fulfilled his promise to not leave you as orphans? He's done so by his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who comes bearing his word into your ears so that Jesus is always with you through his word. When you hear Jesus speaking, you're hearing it, hearing him by the Spirit. And most importantly, when you believe the word of Jesus, when you believe that his word is truth, that's the Spirit doing the Spirit's business. Notice again the title that Jesus himself gives the Spirit. It's called the Spirit of Truth. Not of one truth or many truths, but of truth, the truth, the Spirit of Jesus. So by the work of the Spirit, this is what you know. You know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Savior. You know that his blood atoned for your sins. You know that his death destroyed your death. And you know that his resurrection is proof positive of your own bodily resurrection on the last day. You know this is the truth because you've received the Spirit of truth through his word and by your baptism. You first received the Spirit in your baptism when faith was given to you through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul told Titus. You keep receiving the Spirit when your sins are declared forgiven for Jesus' sake. The Spirit preserves you in the true faith through the proclamation of Jesus' word. And the Spirit, the Spirit that proceeds from the Father, who is sent by the Son, joins Jesus' own word to the bread and wine to give you his very body and blood. This Sunday, after our Lord's ascension, which we celebrated on Thursday, the Sunday between the ascension and before Pentecost, used to be called Waiting Sunday. Waiting Sunday. Because the time that we are in now in the church is a time of waiting between our Lord's ascension and his coming again on the last day in judgment. The work of salvation is accomplished and the fruit of his saving continues in our lives. It's Christ's work and he is here amongst us doing it. He's not absent, he's present through his word and his gifts to accomplish exactly what he promised the disciples on that night. And at the same time, we wait. We wait for its fullness, its completion, having see him ascend 
and now watching for him to come again in the same way that he ascended. We look for the ascended Lord to come upon the clouds to judge the living and the dead. And so we wait. And while we wait, we cry out, exaudi, that is, hear us, O Lord. Hear us as we pray. Hear us as we struggle against our sin. Hear us as the world seeks our hurt and harm. Hear us as we are assaulted by enemies outside and within. Hear us as our possessions and income fail. Hear us as we doubt your preserving hand in the midst of a pandemic. Hear us as we doubt your coming again. Hear us now as we grow impatient. Hear us, O Lord, and hide not your face from me. We cry out. And if we didn't have our Lord's word of promise, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send my spirit upon you. That waiting would not be possible. Our lives would be marked by impatience and doubt. Because apart from Christ, there is no cry of Christian prayer. There's only the cry of despair and panic. Apart from Christ, there is no living, but only hastily bull rushing towards our death. But in Christ, you wait with hope. With Christ, you pray without ceasing, knowing that the Father hears your prayers. In Christ, you daily die to sin and rise to new life in him, forgiven. You live knowing that the end of all things is at hand. And having received the Spirit, you also then bear witness. Your lives are witness to the overflowing grace of your Lord. You speak, you live, you receive the truth here and in your families and in your communities. You pray and love one another earnestly. You cover each other's sins. You're hospitable. You speak to one another the truth, the word. And you hear the word with glad hearts. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has not left you orphans. He's at work in your life even now. Because it's the Spirit that gave force to the witness of the apostles. It's the Spirit who bears fruit in you to be faithful, charitable, hospitable, to be faithful like them even unto death. Most of all, the Spirit gives you the word to say when truth must be spoken. It's the Spirit who is the great defender of the truth. He is the Spirit of truth, after all. And so he continually is raising up in our midst faithful Christians to defend the truth through word and deed before pagan, unbeliever, and hypocrite. By the Holy Spirit, you've received Jesus. By him, the church is glorified through Jesus Christ. By the Spirit, the elect are gathered from the four corners of the world from every people and place and age to be with Jesus forever. And for all this, thanks be to Jesus. In his holy name, amen. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the whole Church, that in the confidence of faith the baptized may bear witness to the grace of the Lord Jesus, regardless of the consequences. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our pastors and missionaries, that repentance and the forgiveness of sins in Christ's name would sound forth throughout the world, creating and sustaining faith in those who hear. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that the spirit of truth would guide us into faithful devotion and service, so that we would love one another, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and give our tithes and offerings to, to support his ministry and mission here and abroad. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer for their witness to Christ, that they may be strengthened by the spirit of truth to endure, and that they may rejoice and be glad when Christ's glory is revealed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For our government and all leaders in this world, that they would submit themselves to the true King and Lord, Jesus Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For all who serve in our armed forces, the medical field, and for all emergency workers, that in trusting themselves to Christ's protection, they may know his saving peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For an end to the pandemic, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For all graduates, for those who set out to look for new employment, and for those whose plans have been frustrated or disappointed, that their confidence may always be placed in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, the afflicted, the dying, the mourning, and the lonely, especially those whom we now name in our hearts. That Christ himself would be their health in sickness, their joy in sorrow, and their life in death. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who once again look forward to returning to the Lamb's feast, that being made partakers of Christ's divine nature in the eating and drinking of his very body and blood, they would once again be filled with his life and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful departed, let us offer thanks and praise, asking our Heavenly Father to grant us all a share in the rest and peace of his kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above that your word may be not bound but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you and in the confession of your name abide with you unto the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.